Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. My name's Tom Press, and I'm uh, guest hosting for Walt tonight on Mystery Babylon News Radio. My program is called Inquisition Update, and it's on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And Walt has asked me to come and do a series of discussions on the diabolical Jesuit roots of the New World Order. And I chose for our discussion a little booklet, a, a very rare little booklet, It's entitled The Origin of Dispensational Futurism and Its Entry into Protestant Christianity. And we've already covered Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, the 70th week of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And we've already determined from that prophecy that it speaks of Christ and no one but Christ except for a parenthetical uh, insertion of a reference toward the people of the prince that shall come, Prince Titus who in 70 A.D. fulfilled another one of Jesus' prophecies regarding the temple, and that not one stone remained upon the other. Last time on the program, we were talking about the futurist view of this prophecy. The futurist view says that, verse 27, and he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, does not talk about Jesus Christ, but that it is some future antichrist. And we know this to be erroneous because a careful reading of the scriptures indicates that this verse, verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9, speaks of Jesus Christ, and it was perfectly fulfilled by Jesus Christ during his seven-year ministry in Jerusalem, when in the midst of that week he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease and gave up his life, but not for himself, for us all. And now, having done that, the veil of the temple is ripped from top to bottom, but instead of accepting Christ as their Savior, the Jews insisted on continuing the animal sacrificial system in abject rejection of Christ's one-time all-sufficient blood sacrifice for the remission of sins and the salvation of Israel. So... Jesus plainly told them, Your house is left unto you desolate. And now we know that God no longer dwells in temples made with hands, despite the fact that most of the Christian world is looking for a new temple to be built by men on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, and that the Jews will again begin animal sacrifices and oblations to eat and drink damnation to uh, to themselves, but we know it all to be a lie. It's called futurism. And we read the the little paragraph in this book dealing specifically with futurism, but before I want before I move on to the next little portion of this booklet, I want to cover one more aspect of the last statement that's made in this paragraph. Again, you'll you'll find this familiar because we spoke about it last time. It says, Antichrist would reign for three and one-half years, according to this futurist interpretation of Daniel 9, verse 27. And his teaching was embellished with a rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem, revival of the Levitical laws and sacrifices, plus various Jewish aspects in addition to the wholly unfulfilled persecution of the church. Now stop right there. We all know that the first century Christians were persecuted by the pagan Roman Empire. They were made sport of, and they were fed to lions in the Colosseum. It drew huge crowds from all over Rome to come and watch the Christians being fed to the lions. And why did the pagan Roman Empire choose to feed Christians to the lions in the Colosseums? Because it was Daniel who prophesied the 70 weeks of Daniel. And we all remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den. What they literally were doing was making mockery of Daniel, making mockery of his prophecy, and making mockery of the Messiah that he prophesied would come after the 69th week at the beginning of the 70th week when he would be baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptizer, 
then three and a half years later, fulfilled the prophecy by causing the sacrifices and oblations to cease, God confirming that covenant by the, temp- the veil of the temple being rent, thus putting a permanent end to animal sacrifices. And that is how God chose to fulfill that prophecy. Just exactly the way the angel Gabriel gave it to Daniel, just exactly the way Daniel prophesied it, and just exactly how Jesus Christ fulfilled it. But this idea that it is wholly unfulfilled, the persecution of the church, the pagan Roman Empire persecuted the, the Christians the same way they would have persecuted Daniel. Cast him into the lion's den. And the persecution didn't end there. When the pagan Roman Empire ended and the so-called Holy Roman Empire rose up at the time of Constantine, when Caesar, the one who now leteth, when Caesar, Constantine, left Rome and set up a new kingdom in the east in Constantinople, he left a power vacuum in Rome. And that's when the Holy Roman Empire began, when the papacy stood up in his place, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who would deceive the whole world, the papacy. And from that point on, the persecutions continued, and they continue to this day. Now, this part of our history has been omitted from our learning today in the schools and in the churches. Prior to our generation, everyone, everyone who considered himself a Protestant was required to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it covered the persecution of the Waldenses in the early centuries of the Holy Roman Empire, the Albigensians of southern France, Bible-believing Christians of southern France, the Hussites, uh, uh, being John Huss and his and his friend Jerome in Prague, and the Protestants, and the merciless persecution and pursuit of these people until they could be completely wiped off the face of the earth. The Albigensians are gone today. There's nothing left of them. Even their history has been destroyed. When one would attempt to to establish their existence in the world, they wouldn't be able to to convince anyone in a court of law. There's no history to be found of these people. Only word of mouth remains of the Albigensians of southern France who would not bend the knee to the papacy, who referred to him as the Antichrist. And likewise with the, with the Waldenses, the valley people, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Alps of northern Italy and western Fran- or eastern France. And so the persecutions, the crusades, the inquisitions continued. And as a formal act of the Roman Catholic Church, for a period of 605 consecutive years, through the papacies of 83 consecutive popes, God's people, just like those first century Christians who the pagan Romans threw to the lions, were pursued by the Holy Roman Empire. And there are estimates. The Spanish Inquisition has records that have, been, that have been thoroughly researched, and the total of those persecuted in the Spanish Inquisitions are 50 million people. That's an, ex- that's an accepted number, 50 million people. But that's only the Spanish Inquisition. Researchers who have delved deeply into the persecution of the church, those who believe in Jesus Christ and hold to him and him alone, estimates range as high as 500 million of God's people have been persecuted and gruesomely tortured and murdered by the Roman Catholic Church and no less than being burned at the stake. The types of persecutions used by the Roman Catholic Church against those who would not come to Mass and those who would not confess their sins to a filthy, sinful priest, those who would not bend the knee to the man of the Roman Catholic Church who calls himself 
the vicar or the replacement of the Son of God, the Pope of Rome, were mercilessly pursued and persecuted and slaughtered. The earth is literally soaked with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And the, and the golden cup that is held in the hand of the woman described in Revelation chapter 17 is full of their blood. And she's drunk with the blood of the saints. She's literally made a living killing God's people. And for someone to say the persecutions of Christians is wholly unfulfilled, the persecution of Christ's church is wholly unfulfilled in history, is simply bereft of any knowledge of history. Now, having completed the little paragraph having to do with futurism that has deceived the whole Protestant world today, we'll continue now our discussion about the Protestant reformers. What did they believe? Were they futurists? I'll tell you before we even begin, they had never even heard the term, never contemplated the term. They saw in the papacy, and only the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical antichrist. Now, the author of this little booklet says, quite distinct from the two foregoing schools, and, and we were talking about two schools of prophecy that are popular today, the preterist view, which says that all Bible prophecy, particularly in the book of Revelation, was fulfilled before the rise of the Holy Roman Empire. And the futurists who say that Antichrist won't come until the last seven years, and therefore Antichrist is not a factor in the world today, has not been a factor in history, and then the Pope cannot be the Antichrist. The papacy cannot be the Antichrist. All right. The, the Reformers were neither preterists nor futurists. They were what we term historicists. That's what they termed themselves. It says, quite distinct from the two foregoing schools, preterism and futurism, as we've already discussed, were the Reformers, who were without exception known as historicists. That is to say, those who believe that the book of Revelation foretold a perfect sequence of the history of Christendom throughout this present evil age from beginning to end. Now, when did this present evil age begin? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and it won't end until Christ returns. Now, they believed that the, the book of Revelation, the prophetic books of the Bible, talked about the entire Christian era, from the crucifixion of Christ until his return. They did not believe that Bible prophecy was fulfilled before 70 A.D., or during the pagan Roman Empire. They did not, and they'd never even heard of either one of these schools of Bible prophecy, futurism. They were historicists. Again, it says, those, they were those who believed that the book of Revelation foretold a perfect sequence of the history of Christendom throughout this present evil age from beginning to end. Also, the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ from his ascension in power to his consummation when he returns in glory. There's the consummation spoken of in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. He shall make it desolate even until the consummation. The temple of Israel, if it is ever built, will not be a house wherein God dwelleth. That house was reduced to rubble, not one stone standing upon itself. No more animal sacrifices will be acknowledged by God. That house is desolate and will remain desolate even unto the consummation, even if they rebuild it. God no longer dwells in temples made with hands, but he lives in us all. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, he says further, he says, The book of Revelation, as taught by the Protestant Reformers, exposed with paramount certainty the complete failure of both pagan and papal Rome, that is, the old pagan Roman Empire, and the Holy Roman Empire, and especially the utter and complete destruction of the latter 
in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And if you will read Revelation chapter 17 and 18 as though they were just one chapter, you'll get a circumspective view of the Roman Catholic Church and the kingdoms of the world over which it rules. Revelation chapter 17 and 18 were regarded by the Protestant Reformers as being the key to unlocking all of the prophecies regarding the Antichrist. And it was through Revelation chapter 17 and 18 that these Protestant Reformers, once Roman Catholic monks and, and, and other prelates of the church, once they had read the scriptures in their own languages so they could read them for themselves and understand through the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit what was being taught, they understood that the subject of Revelation chapter 17 and 18 was the papacy and the nations over which it ruled, and it was describing the judgment of the Roman Catholic Church and that church-state system, the woman riding the beast. And they were absolutely right. And there was no dissension among them. Every Protestant reformer to the man believed that Revelation chapter 17 and 18 spoke of none other than the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy and the governments of the world that answered to the Pope as though he were Christ on earth and that persecuted the saints of God. And they've been persecuted for 2,000 years. And who is it who could say now that the, the Antichrist has never been in the world and won't be in the world until the last seven years of time? In an obvious twisting of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Anyone who has a competent knowledge of history perfectly understands that the body of Christ has been persecuted since the days of Christ. And that persecution will continue. The scriptures confirm it. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And they have, ever since those words were uttered 2,000 years ago. So now you know what the Protestant Reformers believed. They believed that the papacy was, is, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, and you may look for none other than the papacy in your search for Antichrist. And they were united in that belief, and they spent the rest of their lives warning all who would listen, whether they were Roman Catholic or not Roman Catholic, to come out of that church and to to obey the commandment in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5, come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Remember, the first words in Daniel or Revelation chapter 17 is, come with me and I will show you the judgment of the great whore, the Roman Catholic Church. And the Protestant Reformers led as many as would come out of the Roman Catholic Church in protest against the Antichrist, against the woman, the Roman Catholic Church, the whore, who went a-whoring after all the other gods of, of antiquity and just lumped Christ in just as a token mention in order to deceive God's people. But God's people have never been deceived. They've always known that the Roman Catholic Church is not the church of Jesus Christ. It is the church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan. And if you'll read the writings of the Protestant Reformers, there are all many of them available to be read free on the Internet these days. You may read those works and you will find unanimous opinion, unanimous consent among the Protestant Reformers. The papacy is the Antichrist, always will be. Now stop and think. If today, because we believe we've been taught all of our lives that Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years of time, and he'll sign a peace treaty with the Jews, allowing them to begin animal sacrifices again, and in the halfway through the period of the, of the seven-year treaty, after three and a half years, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, well then, how can 
how can the Antichrist be the papacy? You see how they confuse the issue? The Protestant reformers were not deceived. They knew it was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he gave up his own life. And when you read their works, they will tell you this. And when you fully come to the comprehension of what the Protestant Reformation was all about and what the Protestant Reformers believed, you will understand as the way I do that futurism was a horrendous deception. The greatest deception, I call it, since the Garden of Eden and has led millions upon untold millions into a lie. And it's time for us to know the truth and to repent and return to Protestantism. <clears throat> now, how did dispensational futurism enter Protestant Christianity? Now we're going to begin to, dis to, to discuss precisely who and how this futurist school of Bible prophecy came about. Who was responsible for it? For what purpose was it created? And what are its consequences today? The author says the reformers to a man. That means every single one of them without exception. The Protestant reformers to a man fiercely contested the futuristic thesis propounded by Ribera, Jesuit priest Francisco Ribera, whose commentary on the book of Revelation is in the Cambridge Library, and all futurist commentaries since then are based on it. So this entire futurist and every author that has ever written about this phony futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy gets his information from a work that was produced by a Jesuit priest by the name of Francisco Ribera. Now remember, we told you about the Jesuit oath. What are the Jesuits sworn to do? To destroy Protestantism. That is, to destroy the protest against the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the one who comes in his own name, as the vicar of Christ, or the replacement of the Son of God. His very title is blasphemy. He is the Antichrist, but the Jesuits cannot promote their new world order. They cannot raise the papacy to global, universal monarch of the world until they destroy Protestantism. And since it would be technically very, very difficult to destroy every Protestant in the world, they must deceive as many Protestants as they possibly can. And they did it through futurism, a creation of a Jesuit priest named Francisco Ribera. Now, his work remains at the Cambridge Library, and all futurist commentaries since then are based on it. However, it was left to another Jesuit by the name of Emmanuel Lacunza. Emmanuel Lacunza who lived from 1731 to 1801, to complete the deception, and through him, dispensational futurism entered Protestant Christianity. So Ribera cooked it up, Emmanuel Lacunza added to it, and then injected it into the Protestant churches. It says, at the time of the overthrow of Judaism in A.D. 70, by the prince that shall come, remember Prince Titus, the son of Vespasian. It says, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was carried from Jerusalem in a casket to Vespasian, who granted him permission to make his abode at Jamnai near the sea. Under his brilliant leadership, Judaism was revived and restored. Now remember, Judaism was a mixture of the Torah with the Babylonian Talmud, that which they obtained when they were in Babylonian captivity. It was the mixture of the holy with the profane. Okay? Judaism is not the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Judaism was judged by God during the Babylonian captivity, and is in a sense saying that if you're going to worship like the Babylonians, then you go to Babylon to do it. 
That's what the Babylonian captivity was all about. A just recompense for their Babylonian style of worship. They had corrupted the temple. They had corrupted the, the religious system as God gave it to them and instructed them to worship him. And they mixed Babylonianism with their, their worship, and God placed judgment upon them. And for that reason, they were held in Babylonian captivity. And again, at the time of Jesus Christ, when he walked the streets of Jerusalem, they practiced this, uh, 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 the same diabolical mixture of Babylonianism and, 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 and true, the true faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you read carefully the New Testament, you will understand exactly the words that Jesus was using to describe the religious leaders of his day. They had added to and they had taken away from. What did they add to? Babylonianism. And what did they take away from? God's holy law. Now, under Zakai's brilliant leadership... Judaism was revived and restored. Jamai became the headquarters of world Jewry and remained such for four centuries when it was transferred to Babylonia where a heavy Jewish population had remained since the Babylonian captivity. Yochanan ben Zakkai revived the Babylonian Talmud and his was known as the Palestine Talmud and it is and it's it, and its com uh, compositors was Yochanan ben Zakkai, another Jew by the name of Akiba, another by the name of Meir, and a man named Judah the Great, being Rabbi Judah, whose title was Hanasi the Prince. Now, Babylonia remained the center of world Jewry for the next several centuries, but as they became a state within a state, the Persian kings finally arose against her. Some leaders were hanged. Talmudic schools were closed, and the surviving Talmudists fled, finding refuge in the city of Cordova in Spain. Now remember, Cordova is a Roman Catholic city in a Roman Catholic state named Spain. Probably the most Roman Catholic nation of history. Spain. Now, Cordova became the world capital of Babylonianized or, or Babylonized Judaism for several centuries, and here Jewry enjoyed her golden age. Jewish influence was felt in both church and state, and in Spain, thousands of Jews called Maranas joined the Roman Catholic Church while secretly adhering to Judaism. Now, I can tell you why these Jews apparently, and I use that term correctly, they apparently joined the Roman Catholic Church, and it was simply to avoid persecution. Remember, the Roman Catholic Church teaches replacement theology, that Roman Catholics now replace the Jews as God's chosen people. That's why the Pope wears a yarmulke. Stop and think about it. What, what purpose does the Pope wear a Jewish yarmulke on his head, that little white skull cap on top of his head? It's simply a proclamation to the whole world that looks upon the, pape, looks upon the Pope when he puts on his yarmulke that he has replaced the Jews, that the Roman Catholic Church has replaced the Jews. Let's say, Tom. Yes. Uh, uh, we uh, made a little mistake on the scheduling. We only have a minute left. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to wrap it up. We'll continue uh, with our discussion of the Jewish, or rather, <laughs> the Jesuit foundations of the, of the New World Order. The Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And it could not be possible had they not deceived God's people, the Protestants. And I'm sure you'll find the discussion next time very, very interesting. So please come back to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Fress, host of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening.